Newberry medalist Catherine Applegate joins us now. I am so thrilled to be here. And it, it took a while to get here. But here we are. <laughs> Long no thanks to me. We are so thrilled to have Catherine Applegate, the Newberry Award winning author of, of the one and only Ivan with us. Uh, I think I cut out, didn't I? A little bit. Okay, let me try that again. We are so excited to have Catherine Applegate, the Newberry Award-winning author of the one and only Ivan children's book, uh, and she has a new book out, and we're so excited to hear about wait, wait, it. Wait, wait, Tim, it's and, it's almost out. Oh, that's true. It's when almost out. We're recording out. the show. It's not quite out yet. We still have uh, a week, a little bit over that's, a week to wait. There it is, right there. It's the advanced copy there that we have. Okay. <laughs> Not available in stores yet, but uh, you can already sign up for it on Amazon, I noticed. Yeah, it's so the uh, 22nd of September. Awesome. Very cool. So tell us tell us about the book. We're so excited to hear about it. Oh, I, this was um, really a labor of love. And by that, I mean an extended, like, elephant-sized labor. <laughs> it went on for a long time. Um, it just took me a while to figure out how to tell this story. I wanted to talk about uh, childhood hunger and poverty, about working poor families and that sort of thing. But I wanted to do it in a gentle, child-friendly way. And I simultaneously had this obsession with the idea of a giant, hairy, imaginary friend cat. And the synthesizing those two very different ideas took me a while, but uh, I think I finally figured it out. So why don't you share a little bit of the plot uh, with us of uh, what's going to, what we expect in this book? Well, Crenshaw is, and I love this cover. This is Crenshaw. That's oh, yeah. all it's beautiful. All you ever see of the guy. He's a, a tuxedo cat, black and white and quite enormous. I mean, you know, good, I don't know, what do you say, five and a half feet or so. Um, and he is the childhood imaginary friend of a kid named Jackson. Jackson is a real down to earth, just the facts kind of guy, um, loves science, wants to be a biologist when he grows up, has uh, many obsessions, manatees, bats, you name it. Um, and Crenshaw appeared to him when he was quite young, um, about, well, seven, which, you know, seems a little on the, on the scale of uh, ages for imaginary friends to appear a little bit older, but it turns out, I did some research, and it's actually quite common at mm. that age. So Crenshaw shows up, hangs out with him for a while, disappears, life is good, he goes on, and um, in the middle of a family crisis, when Jackson is in fifth grade, uh, Crenshaw reappears. And this is extremely disturbing to a kid who's, um, you know, a, a scientist at heart. Why is, he, why is he talking to a giant cat in a bathtub, you know, who's obsessed with purple jelly beans? It's, it's <laughs> clearly something has gone very, very wrong with his brain. So he has to work through this, even as his family is working through a lot of economic problems. And I wanted to create a very happy, intact uh, family. His parents are loving, former musicians. Then they, uh, as Jackson puts it, became normal people. But uh, <laughs> they had uh, regular jobs. Dad got MS, couldn't keep his construction job. Mom was a music teacher, town size. And they're desperately trying to piece together enough part-time jobs to the roof over Jackson's head and his little sister. And there are days when Jackson and Robin are actually hungry. This is a huge problem in our country. And um, it was something I wanted to talk about. I don't think we talked about it very much. And, and I, you know, having that advanced copy to be get a, a chance to see the relationships between the brother and sister and reading the part about how they're interacting in the, the part where, you know, Crenshaw starts to come around and Jackson's wondering, is he the only one that's actually seeing this cat? And, and, and I love how you built in this, this boy, this, this main character who does have that. I don't have an imagination. I've left that behind. I'm all about the facts. And, um, 
And uh, is that something that you took from people that you've met or is that your experience? Where, how do you build a character like this? I have a son who's a bit like that. He's a techie, um, loves to read nonfiction, extremely well read, but not a big fiction guy. And so maybe, maybe a hint of it came from him. Um, I think there are a lot of kids around fifth grade who start getting very worried about how they're perceived by others. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's time to grow up. And uh, I think that was why that, that cusp between fourth and fifth grade seemed like the perfect time for, for this guy to reappear in Jackson's life. Um, he, and he was a fun character to write because they, they work against each other so well. As I envision the talking cat, their um, Crenshaw is unpredictable, I guess you'd say. <laughs> very, uh, very blunt. Uh, and um, I, I, somebody was talking to me and said, you know, if they were going to cast Crenshaw, they, they'd have to use Bill Murray. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not the first thing that came to mind, but yeah, sure, why not? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's a, he's a very um, very outspoken and understands. I think now I don't know. Did you guys have imaginary friends growing up? I was wondering that about you too. I mean, did you have an imaginary friend? I did not. I had yeah. animals. Um, you know, they, I have one on my lap as usual. Um, <laughs> uh, grew up with a menagerie, and I think maybe dogs. And cats serve that purpose for me. Mm. I was very. That's interesting because uh, we we don't have any animals, and my son had imaginary friends. Ah. Uh, so maybe there is a connection. And I'll tell you something: imaginary friends are a lot less worth. I mean, you're not. <laughs> it's a poop. And a poop. You know, it's believe me, much easier. Um, so I no, I've always thought it was a really cute way for a child to cope with crises though. I, it's um, it's so convenient. You create this scapegoat, this friend, this confidant, um, it's entertainment, you know, cheap entertainment. It's it's a great idea. It's a shame that adults don't don't have imaginary friends more. Or, or maybe we do and we just don't talk about I do. I got I got a ton of them. I have no real friends, <laughs> just imaginary friends. That's Facebook, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> No, they're even imaginary on Facebook. That's, I created no, all those profiles. Saying. Yeah. <laughs> it counts. It all counts. It's all good. No, I, I really do love how you've written Crenshaw. He's, he's, he's sassy and kind of like, I, I heard an analogy made one time that, you know, when kids are young, they're like puppies. But when they get to those middle ages and middle school years are more like cats, they come around when you put food out and they might want to sit next to you on the couch sometimes, <laughs> or sometimes they like want to go do their own thing. And, oh. and so uh, I, I think the way you've written Crenshaw is, is perfect when, you know, and uh, I've been connecting to all the characters in that, which I really love about the books that you write is you can really connect to the characters. Um, and that's what, that's what makes them powerful. Yeah, I, I I can relate to that too. You know, just the fifth grade years, and are you are they still little kids, or are they like teenagers yet? I mean, yeah. I, we did this global school play day thing where the kids were able to bring in whatever they wanted to to play with, and I've got this big giant fifth grade boy sitting on the floor, laying da- laying on the floor in my classroom with little cars making sounds, <laughs> riding them around and stuff, and I'm like. Hello. Oh my goodness, this is so good for me to see because they are still little kids, yeah. you know? Absolutely. I mean, you know, you yeah. secretly want to be there on the floor too. Let's play a soda. <laughs> <laughs> totally. We never grow up. Um, so, uh, just so our, our uh, viewers know too, you guys can uh, add questions for uh, Catherine in the uh, chat down there. So, if you have any questions, we might use them on the air. No, uh, no part of yeah. physics, nothing like that. Okay. <laughs> no, 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 no. But uh, personal questions for you or uh, uh, questions about the book and everything. How about, uh, did you have any struggles uh, in, in writing this book? Anything that were a sticking point where you were just kind of like writer's block or anything like, or did it just kind of flow out of you? Oh, flow. That sounds really nice. I wonder what that's like. <laughs> <laughs> God, no, it was really hard. I, I Part of it was post Newberry angst, I think. Um, I've talked to a lot of Newberry winners and they all said 
the key to getting onto your next book was already having one underway, but unfortunately I didn't have one underway. So there was that. There was a weird attempt to synthesize these two very different ideas. There's the fact that I'm a consummate procrastinator. Um, all of that combined, and then a lot of touring. There's a, I was doing a lot of traveling and touring, which I love, but um, definitely makes writing kind of an off and on thing. Very hard to keep the rhythm going. So I don't personally subscribe to the idea of writer's block because I think writers are narcissists and more whiny and obnoxious. And, you know, I've had real jobs. I've cleaned toilets for a living. <laughs> All at work is. I've been a parent. Um, so I, but I do think, and I would say, you know, there's no such thing as parent block or student block or truck driver block. So I think we get a little... Um, you know, hyperbolic about it, but but yeah, you definitely can can hit speed bumps. I hit quite. Yeah. So one of the major concepts and themes, I guess, running through the book is this thing of the childhood hunger. So tell us about. I know there's a campaign that you're going to be running along with the book, and uh, can you tell us a little bit more about that? That is, I'm I'm so thrilled, Macmillan, uh, the publisher was willing to undertake this idea. It seemed like an interesting way to connect with kids and to get them to think about hunger, um, to do some kind of food drive, but I had absolutely no idea how to, how to make that happen. And they suggested connecting with indie bookstores, which are you know sort of the cultural centers of, of our universe these days. Um, it's, a, it's a perfect place to have food brought in. And um, so Macmillan is, giving $100 to each independent bookstore that signs up and they are given to whatever local uh, food pantry uh, the independent chooses. And uh, there are stickers and signed book plates and all that kind of thing involved too. And then the, the bookstore that raises the most money, I will go visit. And the three runners up, I will Skype with. So um, it was you know, just a little way to, to maybe bring in a little more awareness of what that's going on. There's an interesting organization called No Kid Hungry, which is quite share our strength. And there are a bunch of, of great um, food awareness organizations in our country, but No Kid Hungry is, is one of the best in terms of just getting the word out. And the stat they often use is that about one in five kids is hungry, at least some of the time. And um, I've talked to teachers who brought in food on their own to make sure that at you know, lunch and snack time, kids have something to eat. So um, I, I think this book, too, is a good like stepping off point to talk about this because I know kids might feel worried about sharing this kind of information. Uh, but to have a kid, like a character and a family that they can connect to and say, oh, my family's struggling with that, too, and then be able to say, oh, like let, let's help you let's let's move this forward so that's not a worry of yours so you can just worry about learning is, is super cool and yeah Catherine we have a a question from uh, one of our audience members that wants to know uh, if you if you've thought about writing a series or turning maybe this book into a series that uh, her daughter loves to read series series is <laughs> and uh, and so is that has that crossed your mind that's an interesting question. I had somebody uh, the other day say, um, "There's Jackson's best friend's name is Marisol, and she's a quirky character in her own right. And they said, maybe we should do a book about her. I have sort of an allergy to uh, sequels of any kind these days because I think I wrote so many series. I did mm. with my husband, um, Michael Grant, I did Animorphs, and there were... Oh, it depends on how you count, 54, 63 books in the series. We wrote all but about 20 of them in rapid succession, one a month, while we had a newborn baby. So, Oh, my gosh. That, if that doesn't burn you out of uh, the whole idea of, of series, nothing will. Um, and I did a lot of other series, too. I mean, I started out as a ghostwriter. I think I told you guys I wrote 17 Sweet Valley Twins. Um, so when I, when I hear people talk about series, I sort of... You know, Punch up as it is. <laughs> no, no, nothing. I love books at the beginning and a middle and an end, which is not to say I won't ever do it again. In fact, I have a trilogy coming out in 2016 with Harper, 
called Emily, and it's a middle grade fantasy. So, see, I, I am capable of writing more than one book. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All right. Uh, well, if you don't mind, we're going to switch gears with you right now. I think I probably do mind, actually. <laughs> <laughs> hey, one quick question. So, is it, can yeah. uh, for the, the, fundraising efforts to bring you out to the school does it have to be just a, a classroom or is it an entire school or this is actually um being handled through independent bookstores okay um, through, so through that bookstore there are many other ways to uh, obviously to donate food and no kid hungry again is a great a great source for finding out that information but if you have a, a local independent bookstore that hasn't signed up for the program um they can just go to uh French Chef Food Drive, uh, it's on Twitter, it's on the McMillan site, and they can find out how to do it. It's very easy. Cool. And you know what, uh, before we switch gears, I like this question, and I'm gonna modify it a little bit from one of our audience members, and that is uh, choosing an illustrator. Do you, for this book that you wrote, did you choose your illustrator? Does the publisher choose the illustrator? How does that work? Oh, it's almost always the publisher. They have a stable of illustrators and the art directors look at the book and look at the manuscript and it's like matchmaking, you know, and it's a very subtle process. Um, I've had occasions where I've had a little bit of input into who, you know, which illustrator I was particularly interested in. But uh, what was funny about this one was, as I, I may have mentioned, I was a tab lead on the book. And so, um, they didn't have a lot to work with. They knew they had a little boy and they knew they had a very big cat. And um, I mean, it's just, I, I adore this cover. It's, it's yeah. absolutely perfect. Um, but the, the illustrator's name is Erwin Madrid and he's done tons of stuff. But Crenshaw was a little bigger than I had imagined in my, as I was working on the manuscript. So he grew a tad on the, uh, on the cover and I accomplished it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it doesn't work that way. Yeah, it's a great cover. Yeah. Hey, listen. All right. Well, our, our, our yes, dad that's... used to say, if you turn things in on time, they just give you more work. So you might as well. <laughs> <laughs> that's coming from a principal. <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid that may have uh, I may have taken that to heart way too early in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, let's let's fool around here a little bit. Let's goof around with uh, some questions. We're going to play. Uh-oh. We lost Tim there. <laughs> Calling Go, Go, Tim Bedley. <laughs> go, Go, Tim Bedley. Come back, Tim Bedley. <laughs> Those of you that are listening, we'll hopefully edit this out, right, Tim? Uh, no, I'm going to leave that in just for the fun of it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That okay, let me terrible. let me start that all over again. Okay, here we go. So we're gonna play a game with you today that we're calling Go Go Gorilla. Not Go Go Tim Bedley. <laughs> no, no, not no, not Go Go Power Rangers either. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. So we know that uh, you're most famous for uh, your relationship with a gorilla, and uh, so we're going to ask you some questions about some famous gorillas. And uh, and we're not talking about my husband, right? <laughs> no, 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 no. He's, he has not. the strength of a gorilla, right? <laughs> Indeed, yeah. <laughs> so, Scott, why don't you uh, tell us about who Catherine will be playing for today? Catherine, you'll be competing for Shauna Hammond, a fifth grade teacher in Arizona. If you're able to answer two out of three, yes, that's 67%. <laughs> Shauna will be awarded a free download of the album by the ridiculously popular edgy rock band, Rockin' the Standards, created by Tim Bedley. <laughs> All right. Oh, Shauna, I'm really sorry. I want to apologize. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you'll do fine on these. They're, they're real easy. All right. All right. No Allegedly. <laughs> Allegedly. <laughs> no, they're not. They're really hard. Okay. So, uh, number one, here's your first question on Go Go Gorilla. What artist has an album entitled Gorilla, which also features a track titled Gorilla. Is it A? Neil Young. Or is it B? James Taylor. Or perhaps it's C? Taylor Swift. So there's your three choices. 
I've seen fire and I've seen rain. (laughs) And Neil Young, James Taylor, Taylor Swift are your three choices. James Taylor vibe, but uh, I don't know. I have no idea. Well, just guess. It's it's okay. Okay. It's your first question. No pressure. I was told to guess uh, C every time because that's how teachers do it. Taylor Swift. Oh, that's not right. That's not right. Scott uh, was giving you a big hint there. He was oh, singing no, for I, it. I, I, well, I said James Taylor. Do I not get points for that? Yeah, <laughs> I think she did say James Taylor first, Tim. Oh, did she? Did She did. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so James Taylor is the correct answer. <laughs> yes. All right. um, Woo! Can you um, br- drop the you know IQ points here about 20? Or at least... Okay, we will on this one. Trust me. All here right. we go. Gosh. Get ready. Get ready. Fasten your seatbelt. Uh, in fact, this might... This, this might be a new book idea for you. Okay, Shibani is the latest gorilla craze in Japan. Not that they have a lot of gorilla crazes in Japan, but it's the latest gorilla craze in Japan. Why is Shibani so popular in Japan? Is it A? Shibani is the oldest living primate in the world. Or is it B? Shibani beat out several contestants on one of the top rated game shows, Candy or Not Candy, where celebrity contestants guess if something is candy or not, then they must take a ravenous bite of the object. Is it a shoe or is it real candy? Taste will tell you. Okay, or is it C? Shibani is hot. What? Tim, who writes these? This is awful. (laughs) He's been driving Japanese women crazy, apparently. (laughs) Okay, so... Uh, Shibani the gorilla in Japan. Your choices are: he's the oldest primate in the world. He is the winner on a Japanese game show, or he is really good looking and driving women crazy in Japan. So I hope you, you see the answer, Catherine. <laughs> Scott, dude, why do I even write the questions? <laughs> I my family and I actually went to Japan fairly recently, oh. and somehow we missed this this whole thing. Um, but and they are capable of some extraordinarily weird game shows, really, really funky stuff. However, it's a I, matter of perspective. <laughs> I, I think I see the answer as C. Uh, that is correct. I don't know how you got it. <laughs> Shibani, this gorilla is driving Japanese women crazy. I They're posting never- pictures of him on Twitter and saying how good looking he is. Honestly, I have seen a picture of him, and he is, he's, he's kind of hot. Is he really? <laughs> the crazy we might want coming. to just end the show right there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I've spent a lot of quality time with gorilla photos in the last yeah, three, I'm sure you five have. Years, so, uh, Okay. Uh, well, I guess uh, the last question now for you is Binti Jua. Binti Jua uh, is a gorilla in the Brookfield Zoo in Illinois. Yeah. Okay, is he, fam- he he's famous for doing what? Is it A? Rescuing a child who fell into a gorilla enclosure. Or is it B? Solving math problems. Or is it C? Preferring to be clothed. <laughs> God. <laughs> okay. So your your choices again are uh, rescuing a child, solving math problems. Or preferring to be clothed? Uh, rescuing a child. I'm Did sorry. you actually know that? I, I actually knew that one, yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, that's correct. Yes. Yeah. There was a little kid that fell like face first down into that little pit part, I guess. And uh, she went over there and pulled him out. Or he. I think it's a, a female, actually. And, female, yeah. Yeah. They got pictures of her, uh, you know, carrying and, and fending off the other gorillas while the rescuers were coming and stuff like that. So. Well, it's interesting. They had... Uh, she had been taught to carry a newborn over to be weighed regularly at this window. And so it was, you know, that's essentially what she did is my understanding. She just like, okay, I got, I got a, an infant here and it probably needs some, some checking out. And she just picked it right, picked him right up. It was quite a wow. You didn't happen to stumble upon that for research for your book. Did you? No, I was actually doing a, a one and I only Ivan talk. And I show uh, Yambo, who, who shows up in my book. I, it's an actual true story about this gorilla. A li- same thing happened. I don't know what the problem is with zoo enclosures, but this kid fell into a zoo. Uh, this was overseas, o- over the gorilla enclosure, knocked unconscious, little five-year-old boy named Levin Merritt. 
And uh, Yamba, this giant silverback, comes over and basically touches him and, and caresses him and protects him. It's just bizarre. So I have film of that, and I show it in my talks. And I was doing a school. Very cool. Show, and um, little kid raised his hand and said, yeah, that happened at our zoo, too. And he'd been at Brookfield recently. So that's how I found out about it. Oh, cool. Awesome. Hey, Scott, why don't you uh, tell our audience how Catherine did today? Catherine, <laughs> you got two and a half out of three correct. <laughs> and that's good enough to be a winner. <laughs> Congratulations, Catherine. You've won absolutely nothing. But Shauna in Arizona, she just got a free download of Rockin' the Standards album, the educational rock and roll music for grades two through six. Oh, I'm, I'm very happy for Shauna. And I, I'm sure she's going to be happy, too, when she gets that album. But she's got to get your book. Tell us, Catherine, where can people connect with you, learn more about the the um, the drive, the food drive that's going to be happening uh, that corresponds with the book? Give us that, like, wrap-up information. Uh, CrenshawTheBook.com, um, Macmillan. You can buy the book on the 22nd at any independent bookstore, um, Amazon, all the usual suspects, Powell's, Books Inc. Um, and uh, I'll be doing touring for a couple of weeks. I'm starting out in uh, Michigan at um, Shops, and so I'll be seeing Travis Donkers and then kind of making the rounds, ending up in Texas at uh, Twins Read. Uh, program, which is in Pasadena, I think uh, around the 4th, which should be really fun. I'm going to have a back and forth conversation with Rebecca Stead. Um, I've never met her, and I'm so excited to, um, to chat. So, it's a lot of fun. Cool. Now, uh, do you have a website that people can uh, follow you on? Um, if you go to katherineapplegate.com, you will be forwarded to uh, all the information on Crenshaw. I'm actually recreating my website, even as we speak. All right. All right. Well, That's I what you were doing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> Very cool. All right. Well, thanks so much for being on the show today. Uh, we appreciate it. And we're looking forward to the next book so we can have you on again. <laughs> oh, thanks. You know, I will have all the tech gremlins worked out by then. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> it's, all, it's all a learning process, right? Oh, thank you so much. It's really been a ball. All right. Thank you. And thanks for watching. Mom and Dad. Mom and Dad. <laughs>